going to read beginning in a verse in chapter 7. And of course, I need not to say to you how Christocentric John is. Uh, one writer, as I've told you many times, is sort of generic opening. It's an opening that's applicable when you take any scripture from John. One writer said that in John's writings, John is never visible and Jesus never invisible. And where we're going today, I'm going to lead into it softly while the offering is being received uh, so that I can have your undivided attention uh, to go into a theological matrix that uh, might be endowed with such profundity that you will have to concentrate. Amen. Uh, John, Jesus is never invisible and John makes sure that he's not visible. If you check through the book of John, you will find that he never mentions his name one time talks about John the Baptist, of course, but he never mentions his own name, not one time. He regards himself as another disciple or the disciple whom Jesus loves, but his level of security is significantly calming to the point that he doesn't feel he has to project himself in the story that he is presenting about Jesus. Security is a marvelous thing. Have you ever considered to like who you are and to like what you do and to be comfortable with yourself is a marvelous thing. One of the most disconcerting things is to have someone in your space who is not comfortable with who they are and searching around you looking for themselves. You haven't found yourself yet. Amen. And putting you, and, and when they're searching for themselves, uh, uh, you better find yourself while they're looking. Amen. Because, you know, I don't know, have you ever uh, tried to get the hell out of somebody and while you're trying to get the hell out of them, uh, they're pulling the hell out of you? Uh, I'm trying to say uh, sometimes it's quite a task when you have somebody around who's searching for themselves. John wasn't searching for himself and he was the only one who was at the cross when Jesus was hanging. All the others fled, went somewhere and hid and John was the one who stayed at the cross until Jesus says, woman, behold thy son. And son, behold, thy mother. He was the only one who was willing to stay with Jesus to the point where he could be indicted and die with him. Whereas the braggadocious Peter was running his mouth. Though all men forsake you, uh -huh, I'll stand with you. See, he was still searching for himself. See, John knew himself. Jesus was searching for himself. And sometimes we talk quickly and braggadociously out of searching for ourselves. Oh yes, I've learned you don't have to, uh, when I was younger, a man told me once, he said, man, I just finished running two miles. And I found myself telling the man, I just finished running seven. And I said to myself later, as I became more mature, uh, why was it necessary? Mm-hmm for you to deflate what he achieved by pronouncing something that is nobody's business anyway but yours. See, many times we put ourselves in positions where we say too much trying to be more than we are. Uh, just be comfortable with where you are and who you are. Uh, Paul said in one occasion, I am what I am by the grace of God. Not only what I am, but whose I am. Because the whose I am determines what I am. Uh, very, that's a whole other thing. Uh, 
And so John then is extraordinarily Christocentric in his writings and he pronounces and declares Jesus on a level that that is unparalleled in the Gospels. John is just marvelous. And in John 7, he records Jesus uh, speaking at the Feast of Tabernacles and the water oblation day, the day of the water oblation. And Jesus rides off of the occasion and here's what Jesus says. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Mm-hmm wasn't given he wasn't glorified now John 19 and 34 uh, 33 says but when they came to Jesus they saw that he was dead already they break not his legs but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water and he that saw it bear record and his record is true and he knoweth that he saith truth that she might believe I want you to look at your neighbor and say if you want power you're going to have to have pain amen uh, look at somebody else and say watch that spare watch what you do with that spare In a preliminary observation, uh, just looking at the statement of John in 7.39, you will notice particularly in 39 that the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And what that indicates explicitly, I think, is that there is a distinct relationship between the cross and the Holy Ghost. What the text is indicating to us is that one of these influences the other. The Holy Ghost is not yet given, can nobody get it, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And the glorification in this text is he has not gone to the cross, so the Holy Ghost has not been released. It's saying to me that in order to get to Pentecost, you've got to go through Calvary. Because if there is going to be a release of the Spirit, it has to happen at the cross something about the cross that releases the power of the Holy Ghost into the lives of those who believe on him. And so without release, there can be no giving of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to see and have Pentecost in perspective, then you have to go to Cal interesting dynamic if that is so then there has to be in a more technical you know if we're going theological and you know talking big we would endeavor to simplify the intricately interweaving of theology Christology and pneumatology the study of God theology the study of Christ Christology and the study of the Holy Ghost pneumatology uh, has an interweaving. They are related to each other because if you have to go to Calvary to release the Holy Spirit, then there is a relationship between Christ and the Holy Spirit. 
Oh yes. And if there's a relationship between Christ and the Holy Spirit, then definitely in order to get to God, you've got to go through Jesus. Uh huh. So I got to go through Jesus to get to God. And God gets to me through Calvary. And he touches me now as the Holy Spirit. Oh God, it is quiet. Thank you, Jesus is quiet. Uh, we do that, uh, do know that Pentecost then uh, comes under the heading, the pain of harnessing and releasing power. Because somehow in Christ, we have to harness God. And in Christ, we have to release the Holy Spirit. God's got to get in Christ in order to release the Holy Spirit because of Christ. Uh, are you with me here? He's got to get in the Christ. You can't get to God unless you know Jesus. And you can't receive the Holy Spirit until it's given. And the Holy Spirit is given when Christ is glorified. So somehow, we have to get in God in Christ and then we have to release the Holy Spirit from Christ because he becomes the very center of the operation of the Godhead as it relates to you and I. If that is so, then we have to deal with whose belly and we have to focus on Jesus now because he says, I need you to believe in me. And then out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So the concern we have now is out of whose belly is flowing, is the water flowing? Who becomes the source of the water? When we read it, just plainly looking at it on the surface, it would seem as if, if I believe on him out of my belly is going to flow rivers of living water. But the question now is who is the source? Uh, when we look at the writing and you understand that uh, John had background as a Hebrew and somehow in his presentation of Jesus' statement he is using uh, what we call Semitic parallelism. Uh, in the parallel, you know, the two lines going together uh, with separate little space, but the two lines going the same direction, and parallelism, and it's a Hebrew poetry, and uh, I give an example, uh, in Proverbs 2 and 21, the scripture says, for the upright shall remain in the land, and the perfect shall, no rather, the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. Now, notice very carefully, the upright shall dwell. That's one sentence. And the perfect shall remain. I can substitute upright for perfect and I can substitute dwell for remain, which means that the writer has said the same thing in vo both sentences. And this is why we call it parallelism, because he's not giving us two separate thoughts. It's the same thought. The language then is different, but the theme is the same. And that is if you're a good person, you're going to stay in the land. That's now I just gave you another one. Good, stay, perfect, remain, upright, dwell. There is no different thought. In our translation in the text, uh, we look at 37. And what we do is we put a period behind drink. Uh, and it goes, if someone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Uh, and from the traditional or the Eastern translation, what we end up with, with the next part of that statement is, he who believes in me, comma, just as the scripture says, comma, rivers of living water will flow from his belly. 
if you read it that way, then it is not Christocentric, but it is centered around the one who comes and believes. Now, the Western translation, which is Christological in its implication, uh, goes like this. If someone thirsts, let him come to me, period. And let him drink who believes in me, period. Now, what we get in that translation is thirst and then believe and then drink. What I've got now is you have to thirst first and then you have to believe and then you drink. Now, if out of my belly will flow rivers of living water, if I am the source, then why do I need to thirst? And then why would I need to believe? And why would I need to drink? Uh, I am thirsting because I am not the source of the living water. He that thirsteth hunger and thirsteth after righteousness shall be full. I didn't come in here as the source. I came in here looking for the source. And so Jesus then becomes the source. Now, no notice in the Western or the Christological interpretation. Let's see some parallelism in that. If someone thirsts, let him come to me and let him drink who believes in me. But I could say it another way. If someone thirsts, let him drink. Let him come to me who believes in me. Uh, what he does here now is he makes and it clears, and I'm telling you how brilliant these writers are, an unavoidable allusion to what is predicted in these verses. And that's why I took you to John chapter 19, 34, where he says, but one of the soldiers with a spear uh, fooled around and pierced him. No, the scripture didn't say fooled around. I, I inserted that. Uh, uh, with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, that you might believe. Uh, you see, notice now that he is making an allusion to the fact that ultimately blood and water is going to come out, and that is when he pierces the pericardial sac, then blood and water comes out. The Old Testament is the source of some scriptural citation as it relates to this subject. And uh, Isaiah 43, 19, if you want to note it, I don't know. Uh, Isaiah 44, 3, Zechariah 4, 8, Ezekiel 47, verse 1 through 11. And, and the Old Testament, the scripture had said, I want you to keep that in your mind, believe on me as the scripture had said. And in those Old Testament chapters and uh, passages, you've got the spirit and the living water. Every time you deal with the spirit, you're going to see the illusion or the illustration of living water. <laughs> and uh, as the scripture had said, and they're eschatological images. And don't be frightened by eschatological. It just means anything that's coming, anything that's last days. And Jesus was the last days of the Old Testament prophetic word. He is the fulfillment of that prophetic word. In Numbers 20 and about 8, we see another symbol during the Exodus. And it's used often by John. And then Paul caps it off when he identifies Christ with the rock. Remember the rock that they drank from? And he said to them, he said to Moses, don't strike the rock. I need you to speak to the rock because the rock was going to be stricken at Calvary. I hope you're with me. 
I don't want the rock on two crosses. I've already planned for one cross for the rock. So what I need you to do now is speak to the rock. Now can you imagine that uh, two and a half to three and a half million people are drinking water from a source that doesn't even look like it ought to be producing water. Can I talk to you a minute? Uh, I can understand if they got water from a pond and they got water from a river. But who's walking up to a rock <laughs> looking to drink some water? <laughs> you see, the illusion and the eschatological image is that here is water coming from a source that you never believe contained it oh God and that's why Jesus is never recognized he's always revealed and revelation doesn't come from cognitive energy and intellectuality revelation comes from believing I wonder are you with me you gotta have faith for revelation if you believe on me as the scripture hath said then out of my belly will come rivers of living water. That's why Paul said they drank from the supernatural rock which followed them. And the rock was Christ. I feel like shouting now because uh, so Jesus is the rock from the midst of which living water will flow. I remember him talking to the woman at the well and he told her I have water that is not in this well you can't draw this water you gotta believe on me oh I feel something happening so John then is so concerned now about us believing uh, he's not particularly concerned about us knowing at this point what he wants us to do is believe and John now miracles become signs which reveal not only Jesus is power but it believes and reveals rather who he is it's one thing to believe him for the miracle or a miracle uh, yes to be performed in your life but it's another thing to believe him for the miracle that transforms your life uh, can I go over that again on the one hand you believe his power to cause a miraculous event in your life uh, but on the other hand you have to know who he is in order to transform your life so the question now has changed from what Jesus has to who Jesus is and here's why John made his book so intensely Christological and he wants us to understand that if we have this divine identity revealed then faith will emerge that's why to the end of the book he said but these things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of God and believing you might have life through his name I want to suggest to you very clearly that you can't be a son of God and not be God because oh God I mean not even the revelation then of God in Christ is intimately related to salvation you have to have God in Christ because if not then he is just another human without any divine uh, inherent power uh, notice what he says and I go over it again he says believe on me the Messiah as the scriptures have said because you have to believe God in Christ and that now becomes deity 
then if you believe on me the Messiah as the scriptures have said then out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water which means if you believe on me as the container of God then I will release God to you in the form of the Holy Spirit but in order to release him to you in the form of the Holy Spirit my humanity has to be broken to to release my divinity as a part of your salvation so now our journey here is to harness the power and so we've got to get God in Christ and I'll go around at the back door all sin is an offense against God uh, can I just make an example of you and me and we'll do it in David uh, remember when David stole the black man's wife and had him killed and he was praying in Psalm 51 and what he says to God is against thee and against thee only have I sinned now it seemed to me David you got a little confused according to my record you committed adultery and murder which means you took the man's wife in adultery because you are a despotic monarch they say and then you turn around and have the man killed it seems like you have sinned against Uriah uh, you sin with Bathsheba against Uriah so now why are you simply saying against thee and against thee only have I sinned well because he told the truth it is God who determines what sin is and once that's violated no matter what the context you have sinned against God and since you sin against God God is the only one with the prerogative to forgive sins uh, I'm here to tell you <laughs> God I feel it you know and, and I see it makes sense to me because God can go to Uriah when David couldn't get to him and God can tell Uriah in the grave the I have already forgiven David but David can't get to Uriah God can get to folk you can't get to and God can restore relationships with folk that you can't restore that relationship yourself I don't want you to go nostalgic on me but you can look over your life and some people you said you'd never talk to again somehow God has repaired the relationship because you didn't do it come on talk to me now you went to God with the problem and God fixed you went vertical and God fixed the horizontal or it would have never happened uh, can I talk to somebody in here who still calls their ex every now and then to see how they're doing mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you ain't got over it yet how long you been divorced uh, what 15 years and you still worried about where he is and if he comes to church you gotta go to another service uh, no no I'll sit right beside him or her or whoever give him high five and say ain't God good oh yes and so uh, let me go let me behave you see man cannot redeem mankind only God can uh, and that's why Jesus would uh, he, he'd push him a little bit I mean he'd really push him when he walk into the room and with the man sick of the palsy and he says thy sins be forgiven thee and then somebody with the knowledge says the only only one who can forgive sins is God and I imagine Jesus just gave him a little look like uh-huh that's what I'm trying to tell you when I say thy sins be forgiven thee I am God 
if Jesus then were only human, then all of us are yet in our sins. And I heard you praising him a while ago and you didn't distinguish between praising God or praising Jesus because all of us take it as praising the one. If I'm praising Jesus, I'm praising God. And if I'm praising God, I'm praising Jesus. So I don't have to distinguish my praise. I can just praise God, praise Jesus, praise God, praise Jesus, praise God, praise Jesus. If he were only human, then we are yet dead in our sins. We are cut off from God without hope in this world or the world to come no man can be the savior of man you got to have God to save you it is equally certain then that if God if Jesus rather was God before he became man then the God who manifested himself in human flesh now he can save man uh, I've come to tell you that your confidence and trust in Christ Christ. and your security is if you believe beyond the question that he is God and that he is able to save this morning I called him Bruner but it's actually Himmer and here's what Himmer said and I quote the fact of deity in our savior is prerequisite for our salvation unquote now here Here's how God interweaves uh, theology into Christology. He says, in the beginning was the word. And the word, the logos, was with God and the word was God. The uniqueness of Jesus is the word became flesh. Oh, God, I feel it in here. Became flesh from the Greek is a voluntary action in other words he wasn't created flesh he became flesh of his own volition he chose to take on flesh in his godness oh God which now tells me if he became flesh that his origin and his birth are not one and the same as yours and mine let me go about another way his conceptualization uh -huh, and his birth or his conceptualization is not the same as you and ours ah oh, i feel it here i want to shout he was all ready there before he was born oh god i feel it you you weren't here until you were conceived and your papa was a man your papa wasn't a spirit i wish i could preach to you here uh -huh. your papa was a man he wasn't a spirit he might have had a spirit that you don't like uh, but he was a man you see Jesus was there before he was conceived in Mary which means he chose to go into Mary so that he could wrap a panoply of flesh around his divinity so he doesn't have a human papa Oh God, or else he'd be human. But God is his father. Oh God, and God is a spirit that overshadowed Mary, that induced Jesus. Oh God, now I can understand the virgin birth because there's no other way to speak 
speak about a virgin birth if it's not a spirit being placed in to the womb of Mary without the insertion of a man. Um, all right, are y'all still with me? We just did biology 101 or whatever it is. And that's what makes a virgin birth possible. It's the only explanation for the appearance of God in human form. This then brings me to the fact that there are two kinds of life in Jesus. There's two life associated with the nature of Jesus. And that is one, he has to have human life or creature life, which is imparted life. Somebody's got to give you creature life. And all the explorer has to do is travel through the biological maze to the primal creation. That's why he came through 42 generations. Because Jesus is part and has human life that was created in Adam. Can I tell you that again? All right, I got to come work with you. Uh, let me come around. Oh, God, I, I hope such a neighbor said, wake up. Mm, I know, then bring me that chair, please. Let me, let me talk to the saints for a minute. You see, you have to understand that your life is creature life. It is life that was created, and that's the life you have. Until you receive the Holy Ghost, all you have in you is human life oh yes oh yes uh, we'll talk about it uh, understand it now that God when he spoke everything into existence whatever he spoke into existence wasn't always there so now it has a birthday because he spoke it into existence the clock started ticking then he comes around Brown and breathes into you the breath of life. That's after he takes what he spoke into existence, rolls up his sleeve and meticulously and scrupulously puts you together. He puts you so together that you just love the mirror, don't you? Uh -huh. And you just love, oh my, you can't even pass a mirror without, you know. He puts you together that well that you can't even get by a mirror. Uh, and it's interesting because now he breathes into you the breath of life. And what he breathes into you is eternal and the clue make you a living soul. Now that soul that sinneth it shall surely die. So now we need God to come back in order to restore the soul because our souls have sinned in Adam. Uh, I feel like preaching now. Now what he does with you is the reverse of what happened with Jesus because Jesus was God before he became man and he comes into our life and he takes on the human flesh. You are human before you receive the Holy Spirit. So God comes in into your humanity. God puts on, oh my God, you receive his divinity. Oh God, I feel it. Whereas Jesus received our humanity. He is God first. Now he is trying to make you like him. But he was already like he was, but became like you are in order to take you to him. Give somebody a high five. Say, I got it. I got it. Uh -huh, I got it. I got it. It's critical now because not only does he have creature life, 
but he also has creator life and this creator life is inherent life this is life that has no beginning so he has two kinds of life he has one kind of life that has a beginning and if it has a beginning it can end but he has another kind of life that has no beginning and because it has no beginning it can't end I feel like shouting here that's why he says to them you can't take my life I lay it down and I pick it up when I get ready oh, I feel like dancing in here and so he makes it plain as the father hath life inherent so hath he given it to the son to have life inherent there's two kinds of life in him watch that spear devil uh -huh, you're going to kill one life but you're going to release another and that other one's going to swallow you up Mm -hmm. watch that spare watch that spare oh god i feel somebody getting it in here give somebody a high five for the second time and say watch that spare watch how you jab me watch how you poke me oh, because there's something in me that you haven't experienced yet oh, i feel it here uh, i want to borrow a little bit of mendel's law and Mendel's law goes like this and I quote every individual is the sum total of the characteristics whether recessive or dominant in its two immediate progenitors unquote uh, simply put there is nothing in an individual that was not in the father and mother of that person everything in the mother and the father is in the offspring whether you like it or not you might not know where your daddy is but you go act like him because some of what he is whether recessive or dominant is in you uh -huh, uh -huh. oh yes some of your mama is in you all I got to do is look at your mama and see some of what I'm going to get uh, because she's in you and he's in you if that is so if Jesus' mother and father were human he would inherit all human characteristics and I got a simple equation for that man plus man equals man and no man can redeem man if I were to reverse it and declare that his mother was deity and his father deity now I end up with God plus God is equal God and that would be too inaccessible to man you see the problem of salvation is to bridge the unfathomable abyss which separates a holy God from unclean sinners somebody's got to build a bridge to get to you and I to bring us to him so now I gotta go as the scripture had said and that Jesus is conceived in the womb of his virgin mother God his father which means inherent life is now embodied in created life I need some created life to put in inherent life and God chose Mary and stuck Jesus into Mary so now here's what I have man plus God equals the God man Christ Jesus and he is the only one of his kind he is the monogamy the only 
only one of his kind oh I feel it here God needs Jesus as much as you need Jesus because God can't bless you unless he has Jesus oh, I want to shout I want to shout Jesus stood up and said to them I am the bread which came down from heaven except you eat my flesh and drink my blood you have no life in you oh it set them back we ain't cannibals we ain't cannibals we ain't gonna eat no man Jesus said to his disciples does this also offend you what and if you see the son of man ascend from whence he came I guess you'd say there goes the dinner there goes the lunch there goes the breakfast he said the flesh profiteth nothing but the words that I speak they are spirit and they are life I feel a breakthrough give somebody a high five for the third time tell them I feel a breakthrough here I feel a breakthrough when you go to buy a loaf of bread you don't bring the wrapper home and put it in the toaster you take the wrapper off the bread and then you eat the bread that's in the wrapper the flesh is the wrapper but the bread is in the wrapper and if you mess up with that spear and open up the wrapper something's gonna come out of this wrap that you don't want to deal with devil oh god and so i feel it his most eloquent word to man in fact jesus is god's last word to man and is god's greatest gift oh god i feel like shouting i can give you a gift but don't give you myself uh, we need to talk about that we need to talk about that because many times we give gifts instead of ourselves. Uh -huh, we give our kids TVs so they can watch them go watch the TV so I ain't got no time for you sometimes we give significant others gifts so we can go somewhere and cut up uh, come back with a, after having cut up with a gift what is this for I can't tell you what it's for mm, but here it is oh yes I can give gifts and not give myself and I can give you a gift and I love you oh yes I can that ain't hard to do just give it to you I can give you a gift for you to get out of my face uh, buy you a car so you can drive away you can give gifts and never give yourself but Jesus is a gift that includes the giver for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself you can't take Christ and not get God because God is in the rapper I feel like lifting him up I'm almost there this sound like that old Pentecostal stuff but today is Pentecostal Sunday a Pentecostal with an apostolic flair I done went way back there oh God this ain't health wealth and prosperity this is salvation I feel like preaching now give somebody a high five and say this is the Holy Ghost honey this is what this is this is Holy Ghost old time stuff oh man you might not get a Cadillac out of this but you sure go to heaven out of it I can't uh, believe on me <laughs> as the scriptures have said and when you take the old testament you all relax a little bit uh, you gotta go through it it's always jehovah jesus early in genesis he began to show that if i'm having a relationship with man i've got to move from elohim to jehovah the lord god i feel it here every time god dealt with man in the old the name Jehovah was used it was Jehovah in Genesis 2 with the provision of the planet when it came
came to man in his specific creation. It was Jehovah in Genesis 2 verse 7. Jehovah announced the coming redeemer. It was Jehovah that accepted Abel's offering and rejected Cain's. It was Jehovah that made arrangements to save the remnant from the flood. It was Jehovah who demanded sacrificial lamb be placed on the doorpost. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. I don't care what y'all doing in the house. As long as I see the blood on the doorpost, I ain't coming in to check what y'all doing. I just want to know that the blood is on the doorpost. Uh, God didn't save you because of what you didn't do or what you were doing. Uh, he saved you because the blood uh, was on the door. Uh, it was Jehovah on Mount Sinai that gave the code. Uh, and now I conclude that there is one mediator between God and man. Uh, the man Christ Jesus. Uh, can I say that again? There's one mediator between God and men from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible there's only one mediator between God and men and that's the man Christ Jesus give somebody a high five so you ain't got to worship a pastor you ain't got to worship a bishop you ain't got to worship an archbishop you ain't got to worship a cardinal you ain't got to worship a pope. Uh, there is one mediator uh, between God and men. Uh, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. Uh, oh, I feel like shouting in here. Uh, somebody call his name one time, Jesus. I uh, feel it in here. Uh, that's why Isaiah declared the voice of one. Uh, crieth prepare ye in the wilderness the way of Jehovah Jehovah was expected from a prophetic viewpoint to visit the earth that's why Matthew 3 3 has him declaring for this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness make ye ready the way of the Lord make his path straight John said for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will but the will of him that sent me Philip saith unto him Lord I need you to show us the father and it'll satisfy or sufficeth us and Jesus said unto him have I been so long with you Philip and you don't even know Know me he that had seen the father had seen me he that seen me rather had seen the father so how sayest thou then show us the father believeth on me as the scripture had said then out of his belly will flow rivers of living water because he was a candidate to release power but he had to go to the cross to do it but I want to tell you something that the pain didn't begin on the cross but when created life held on to inherent life that was pain all by itself can I preach like I feel it give somebody a high five for the third time and say neighbor the cross is the place where the power of God was released so that I can get a piece of it touch your neighbor for the fourth time and say I have a piece of the rock because I heard Jesus say upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it that's why the Lord hollered the hour is come when the son of man should be 
released I shall die and be glorified I've got to die because there's something in me that I've got to release except a grain of wheat fall in the ground and dies it remaineth alone but if it die it bringeth forth much fruit touch somebody for the fifth time and said you're the fruit I'm the fruit had he not died he would have remained alone but since he died he released the Holy Ghost into all of our lives I'm feeling breakthrough coming can I preach like I feel it can you just imagine with me that we've taken divine omnipresence and we've limited to human dimensions that's pain if I can be everywhere but I gotta focus right here that's pain to take the everlasting omnipresent God and put him in constricting flesh it's like taking my cognitive ability and putting me in a roach can I preach like I feel it that I would take my human cognition my intellectuality and creativity and put me in a roach to crawl around to see can I save roaches well that is not as far as God had to go to get into a human body can you imagine divine immutability harnessed in a vehicle of vicissitudinous changes that's pain to take me from my sameness and put me in a moody body and have me crying sometime and weeping over a dead man named Lazarus that's pain to take divine omniscience and limit it to the finitude of a human brain so that there are certain things that Jesus did not know because it was locked out of his brain the son of man didn't even know when the father was coming back because he locked it out of his brain to take all of that wisdom and put it in the brain to take divine eternalness and bind it up in the periphery of time that's pain because God in Christ oh I feel like preaching and then to suffer hemohydrosis at Gethsemane that's pain then sleepless night while being tried by inferior men that's pain to be sped on to be slapped to be beaten by the Jewish guard that's pain to be marched two miles or three miles to three different courts hungry sleepless thirsty bloody that's pain to be whipped until the skin and the muscles were strips of bloody protoplasm that's pain to have a crown of thorns purple robe wooden scepter and then he's mocked and he's jeered that's pain to be weak and shock dehydrated bloody chills from blood loss yet you put a 75 pound polybulon on his back and tell him walk uphill that's pain then you nail him between the radius and the carpal bone with a five inch spike cut the median nerve his hand end up like a claw that's pain then the open wounds rubbing against the old rugged cross that's pain dehydration asphyxia hypovolemic 
in shock that's pain then he died until the sun refused to shine he died until the temple was rent in two but I just came to tell you you should have watched that spare devil because you release more power than you could have ever found I feel like lifting him up give somebody a high five and say he had to die to release it you got to die to receive it everybody in here has got to feel a mortify I feel like reaching I feel like lifting him up give somebody a high five for the sixth time and say neighbor watch that spare because if you try to hurt me it'll release more power I got some power in me that it takes pain to release it I got some power in me that it takes haters to release it I got some power in me that it takes walking on me to release it I got some praise in me that it takes going through to show how much I can lift up the name of the Lord I've got some power in me that it takes the enemy to come after me for him to realize I'm not a pushover but I am a child of the living God give some money high five for the second to the last time and said neighbor I've got power power to praise power power to worship power power to lift him up power power to overcome power to tell the enemy get out of my house get out of my space get out of my mind In the name of Jesus. I feel like preaching in here. Give somebody a high five for the last time. And say, neighbor, I found something out. I got power in pain. The more pain, the more power. The more you hurt me, the higher I go. The more you walk on me, the greater the release. I heard him say, oh, power. Now we can go to Pentecost. Now we can go to the upper room. After you come through Calvary, you can go to the upper room. It's yours now. Healing is yours. By his stripes, we are healed. Power is yours. Joy is yours. Peace is yours. Money is yours. It's mine.